Zach, welcome in to my makeshift Timbers studio. As you look around, there's a lot going on, obviously, uh, and I've got some heavy jerseys here with the Jack Dewsbury, the, the Sam the Kit Man. I've got Portland Timbers posters, all these keepsakes that I've amassed over the years. For all the different places you go and you have been unable to be able to, you would say, put clothes in your drawer to be able to be settled for months on end, what do you always take with you from California to West Point, to the bubble in Orlando, to Portland? What do you always take with you? Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, I mean, kind of, it's kind of a little thing. I don't really have anything sentimental to take with me anywhere, but yeah. just, I don't know, just my Xbox, really. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of connects me with uh, my friends back home, you know, some players on the team, some people from West Point. Even if it's a little thing, just playing a game of FIFA or something it just keeps me connected, really. No, but how has it been for you over this last couple of years? Your first year as a professional soccer player, what a strange one for you to go from, don't know if you're back home in California, but certainly Costa Rica with the Timbers, back to school, into the bubble, back to Portland. What's this past year been like for you now, obviously, in Arizona, Tucson? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously you can't say you, you saw it coming anyway. Um, it's it's been a roller coaster to to say to say the least. Um, I was drafted by Portland or the Timbers back in in January, and I, I mean it was everything I wanted. And then the next week, I was on a flight to Portland, <laughs> then flight back to West Point, then a flight to Costa Rica, and then I thought that was going to be my reality for that the rest of that semester until I finished college because that, that's what had to happen. And then that's when the pandemic hit. So that that changed everything, changed my outlook on everything, changed it, it changed a lot just on, you know, how everyone's reacting to the pandemic that, that no one saw this coming. I've listened to your interviews. This is our first chat face to face here. And a lot of your interviews, you mentioned the mental fortitude that you've you've learned throughout your time. I want to ask you about this and i don't know anything about this but what is the beast barrack training is that such a thing at west point i believe it's when you when you start out is that right yes so at west point every every summer and depending on your year you have uh, a different military requirement in the summer that you have to do to kind of progress as a as a cadet as a student and as a future military officer at west point so beast is the first thing you do so going into your freshman year and you call it Beast Barracks because it's six weeks long, and it's it's West Point's kind of uh, kind of way to change you from a civilian high school high school kid and a future cadet at West Point. So it's it's basically them emulating like say you go and join the the army out of high school, not in a college environment, but just enlisted, and it's trying to you know make you transition as fast as possible in those six week time frame. Hmm. So what exactly are you going through in terms of training? Can you give us some, some insight behind the curtain type of training to be able to, to change you and, and to make sure that you can transition? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a lot of letting you know that because at West Point it's very diverse. You have people from all over. I have friends from all over the country uh, from, from, yeah, a lot of States, but hmm. Um, it's just basically breaking you down and kind of removing in that removing the person that you kind of were. It, it's kind of funny to say, but they're trying to break you down, make you think that life's miserable for this six week time frame. Oh. Um, let you know that you aren't all that special, even though you got into West Point, even though you may have a 4.0 GPA. And it's kind of making you realize that the people next to you are just as great, if not better at you know, things that you thought you were the best at your whole entire life and just kind of breaking you down, making you realize that you need your teammates and your classmates to help you get through, say, uh, what you think is an impossible chemistry test, uh, calculus test, and so forth. But in, in terms of military, they just just like as, as your imagination would be, marksmanship uh, qualification, land navigation, where you are given uh, – coordinates and a compass and you basically go into the woods because that's where West Point's located basically 
a forest 60 miles north of New York City and just <laughs> <laughs> looking for points in the forest. It's pretty funny. Were there times where you thought, what am I doing here? And, <laughs> and what was, is there a lesson in this? Yeah, like, I mean. You and, your, and your friends? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone goes through that point at West Point, like where you really got to really got to consider like do, is this really for me is it did i really make the right decision like wow i could have because you know geniuses go to that school so you can you have like wow i really they're, they're overthinking like should i have gone to harvard should i have gone to stanford instead like they're really reconsidering their decisions and i mean some stay uh, i mean most people stay some don't but uh a lot of i mean all my friends that i graduated with are happy that they stayed it out and that i think we're all better people for it the last question on this can you remember the breaking point the tipping point where you where you thought i can get my feet under me now and you could push on from that in the moment of relief maybe yeah, from it? yeah. um so how how all the service academies are set up is your first two years you are allowed to leave at any time because college is free but within the back end you pay your service back or pay your tuition back with service in the end uh, of five years, a minimum of five years. Mm -hmm. So the first two years, you're going to college for basically free and you can transfer out whenever you want. You can drop out whenever you want. But right when you start class your junior year, so your third year, that's when you have to pay back the government money right. um, for the entire tuition and your military experience. And that that's kind of like when I was like, okay, this it's time to stop complaining. It's time to start stop looking at things like at a negative outlook and just realize like you're, you're in it for the long run now. Like you're here, you, you just wake up, do, do your stuff, try to encourage like, you know, your, your teammates on the team, the younger guys that are going through what you went through a year ago, two years ago. So, it, I mean, that was really the, the breaking point, just changing the mindset of you're here now, there's nothing you can do. You can't leave. So just, just keep <laughs> grind it out. Let me take you to another point, another moment, whether this was on the day or whether you had an inkling before, but you mentioned when you were drafted by the Portland Timbers, did you know that you were going to be drafted? Did you know that major league soccer teams were interested in you? You're the first player from army West point to be drafted into MLS. Did you know? And what was the feeling like when your name showed up as a Portland Timber? Yeah. So I, I had a pretty good idea of, that I would get drafted, but I, I wasn't sure by which team or what round or how high or how low. Uh, I, I trained with LAFC going into the, my senior year that summer just because Los Angeles is home and my head coach at West Point was on, you know, multiple national team staff. So he was able to get me into training sessions with the LA Galaxy, um, the Red Bulls and LAFC. And, you know, I had a pretty – good understanding just based off of what my coach was saying what he was hearing that I was going to get picked up by some team but I honestly had no idea the Timbers were even looking at me whatsoever <laughs> no no idea so I was actually in uh I was in one of my classes at West Point it was you know with Eastern time it was around three o'clock but at West Point you're not allowed to have your phones out during class so I wasn't even <laughs> I wasn't even able to see like the draft or my name pop up like on the live you know, <laughs> kind of feed, but um, I, I knew I got drafted just based off the fact my phone was just blowing up in my in my pocket. Just my mom calling me, my friends calling me, um, my agent calling me, my head coach at school from West Point calling me. So it it kind of was like I knew I knew it happened, but. I obviously couldn't just jump up, ask my instructor <laughs> to leave, and be like, "I, I have to go." I'm sorry, but it was it was awesome. It was that's great. Rem that's remarkable for for your time at West Point. I know I listened to an interview, and you talked about the uh, amount of structure that you were given, and every hour you were told exactly what to do. Now your structure, being in Tucson, is all to do with soccer and to focus primarily on the Portland Timbers. Is this the first time in your life? And if so, what's it like? Where your structure is just soccer and that's it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely something where at West point there, it was very structured, but you also had so many other things to manage and here just with soccer, it's kind of, you know, not kind of relaxing, but just kind of let, lets you focus more on, okay, you want to get your body prepared for the next session. We have a gym session 
in two hours like I just got back from. So are you going to hydrate for that? You don't have to worry about, you know, an assignment, staying up late at night <laughs> like I would at West Point until 2 a.m. working on an assignment and studying for something. It's really just focusing all on soccer to the point where it, it makes my life easier, where I can perform better on the field and not have so many outliers like, you know, kind of pulling you away from like your main focus and your main job, which is the reality at this point. To be able to to put the best foot forward in terms of your skill set for for listeners, for viewers who wouldn't know much about you, what for you do you do you bring to the table? And I get the sense that you're a humble guy, so it might be difficult for you to praise yourself here. But I'm asking you to, what do you bring to the table? Uh, you know, just just you know, trying to bring as much as the positive I could from college into this level to let it translate and try to get some of the bad habits. So, I mean, obviously I'm a, a larger guy, a larger frame, six six three and some change. Um, I'm, I try to be as physical as possible, but also trying to stay away from yellow cards and dirty tackles and all that. I'm, I try not to make any dirty tackles, but, you know, there's, there's some in there. I was actually uh, – <laughs> Today, funny story today uh, at practice, I side tackled Diego Valeri pretty hard. It was, a, it, was a clean, <laughs> it was a clean tackle, but I I knew it right when I did it. I was like, oh man, if, what, yeah, was, I should have done that. Should have pulled out on that one. But is everything, uh, everything all right? Is it? Yeah, I mean, he's, it's he's not like you're a rookie. You're second year though, so yeah, I know, maybe you're allowed but, to. Yeah, um, but he's good. He's good. He rolled around a little bit. I was very concerned, but he's good. Um, I'm very good in the air. I, I try to win all my aerial duels because, I mean, you look at me and you just assume that I can, and that's that's kind of what you get with me. Yeah. What what about if I asked you your speeds and with Tega Akoba, <laughs> a big racing match I'm starting to hear about, and you have bet your car <laughs> online with Laris Mabiali, told Mabiala that Dyrone Espria is at least quicker than him. Where would you where would you feature in that race? And would you really give up your car? Do you believe that Espria is quicker? A hundred percent, hundred percent, without a doubt. <laughs> so confident you've put your car on the line. Take so take. I mean, Tega is a big kid. He's just about the same size as me, but it, it takes him a while to get going. Um, and I don't know if there's enough, you know. Uh, leeway for Tega to catch up when Dyron gets taking off, like because he will, he just shoots out of a cannon. By the time Tega kicks in a full gear, Dyron will already be be gone. But at, at that point, <laughs> with uh, with your speed going through, we'll be seeing these great videos of the tunnels when it's a player's birthday or Blanco him coming back and the return from him. I think he had to go up and back yeah. <laughs> in that yeah. tunnel. How quick yeah. you get, have you been through the tunnel yet? How quick do you have to go? And I heard Nick Malonis today when he went through, somebody was pulling his hair. You guys yeah. are useless to one another. Yeah. No, Nick, Nick uh, was dreading it today because, you know, as he puts us through fitness and all these gym sessions, he knows that we're going to, you know, come at him as hard as we can. But... <laughs> <laughs> have but you yeah, been through the tunnel? It, sorry? Have you been through the tunnel? I have. Uh, I did when I first got – I actually did in Costa Rica when I first joined the team there. And then um, uh, for my birthday, once we got back from the pandemic, is June. So right around that time. So I've been it twice. But Seba, Seba had to go through it twice because he came back from uh, from an injury. And then he also – it was also his birthday, obviously. Uh, I can't imagine anybody wanting to mess with you and your six foot three stature <laughs> in your frame. They'd, uh, they'd have some some glaring eyes at the other end. Let me let me finish with this. You mentioned the fitness. Uh, how is it with with the Timbers, one of the few clubs in MLS? You're having to ramp up a lot quicker than than other clubs because of the Champions League match. Do you do you get that sense? And how is it knowing that you're a few weeks away from playing what is a a big big match? Obviously, you have preseason matches in there before his tune ups, but only a few weeks away. Yeah, I mean, I, I like I said earlier, Nick, Nick under Nick's been with the Timbers for so long and just around the game for so long, so he knows exactly like how to gauge the the mileage that we're putting in every day, and he he knows exactly like you know uh, weeks on out like an outline of where we should be, what benchmark we should be at, and let's say my heart rate is pretty high for this past week of training. He can see that 
I'm not recovering as fast as I should or as I should like for a game. And this mm-hmm. is for any player, not just me, obviously. But he'll he'll be able to tailor like, okay, after training or after our gym session or during our gym session, you know, hop on the bike for 20 minutes, get in, make sure your heart rate's at 120 to 140. And then after that point, he'll gauge it again. And, you know, when when it comes time where we're playing these scrimmages or playing each other, uh, you know, 11 v 11, just inner squad, you, you can tell a difference. And you can, we're slowly building up like 30 minute scrimmages, 45 minute scrimmages, 60 minute scrimmages. So, I mean, I think we'll mm-hmm. definitely be there and be prepared for it. Well, Zach, we look forward to to seeing you play in person, hopefully soon. We appreciate the chat. Fascinating story that you have. All the best in Tucson and all the best until we see you again. Thank you, Ross. Thanks for having me.